It is 9 a.m. A jet takes off from Toronto's Malton Airport. Destination, New York's International Airport, Idlewild. 400 miles in 54 minutes. 9 a.m. at the East Side Airlines Terminal in Manhattan. With a load of outbound passengers, an airline bus leaves for Idlewild. Distance, 18 miles. Nine thirty. Having flown two hundred miles, the jet nears Elmira. Nine thirty. The bus has covered twelve miles in the same half hour. Now is on the expressway that runs to the field. Traffic's been exceptionally heavy today, but it looks like clear sailing to the airport at last, unless there's a jam up at the Cloverleaf. Nine forty. Past Middletown, New York, the jet starts descending. 9.40, the bus has the airport in sight. 9.50, the jet from Toronto on the final approach. 9.50, Idlewild, once a desolate swampland, now the world's largest airport. The jet's done 400 miles while you've traveled 18 from town. If you just had the ride out to contend with, the on-the-ground routine would be relatively a lark. But there's ticketing and baggage check-in, which haven't changed much since pilots stopped wearing goggles. Bus passengers fought this battle at the terminal in town. The rest fight it at the airport. Everybody, except that the more imaginative new terminals, must suffer those long walks down endless corridors to the boarding gate. As flight speeds soar, the standing in line, the milling around, and finally the long, long hike to the gate probably seem worse, more out of date. But need the ground routine be as tiring and tedious as all this? Not if you leapfrog the congested highways by taking a helicopter to the airport. This New York Airways chopper, loading up at the East River heliport near Wall Street, makes the Idlewild trip in 17 minutes. New Vertol craft with two turbine engines instead of the single piston engine on this one, can cut the time to nine minutes. The trip's not only fast, but at modest altitudes over the city skyline, a scenic one. At Idlewild, a special air corridor lets copters fly right in without getting mixed up with regular fixed wing traffic. Helicopters, however, will probably never be able to handle more than a fraction of the downtown to airport traffic. London. Railroads may be on the decline, but the British use the old London Brighton line to speed air travelers to Gatwick, London's number two terminal. Trains leave Victoria Station every half hour or so. They make the 25 mile run in 45 minutes, half what it takes by bus. The train virtually takes you to the airport ticket counter. Over the tracks and one flight up to the airport lobby. There's long been talk of using a rail spur to speed passengers to Idlewild. Nothing's happened. But last fall, the newly created New York, Connecticut, Jersey Transit Committee started considering the use of railroads again in a broad new study. At the Federal Aviation Agency's building in Washington, this reporter discussed with FAA Administrator Najib Halabi some of the things that might be done to cut red tape and generally make the ground portion of an air trip shorter and easier. In terms of ground transport, there are uh, various ways in which this can be solved. At the Washington International Airport, we're arranging to have an express highway uh, tying in with the regular freeway system, which for the last 17 miles will be high speed, one way, no commuter traffic. So this will reduce the limousine time. Uh, certain cities are looking at the possibility of monorail. 
uh, so that you can board the monorail downtown and go right out to the airport and get right through the terminal to the airplane. Disneyland serves as a kind of model monorail. We feel it has a lot of unexploited uh, potential. The new look in airports, separate terminals, presents another ground transport problem. Solution, buses to carry passengers from one terminal to another. Separating the major airlines terminals is one good means of reducing airport congestion. But this requires passengers changing planes to transfer from terminal to terminal. They found that cab drivers don't like to take them on such short hauls. The result, missed planes and exploded tempers. B-O-A-C, Barry, Lufthansa, Alitalia and KLM. The trouble is being cleared up now with a steady stream of interline buses. The terminals they connect have tried to combine architectural beauty with functional convenience. National, Pan American's Idlewild Terminal, with its umbrella roof to protect passengers, ground crew, and plane from rain and snow, is a good example of how to make life easier for the airline passenger. Here, passengers enjoy particularly short walking distances to the loading gates, something that's easier to do on an overseas line with its limited number of flights. The baggage check-in counters are most sensibly situated. They're just inside the building, only 70 feet from where the bus unloads. Over the years, nothing has tried passengers' patience more than the contrast between the speed of flight and the non-speed of baggage handling. Conveyor belts have brought considerable improvement. A new travel concept, the air shuttle. Can I make a 12 o'clock shuttle? Yes, sir. Simply take a boarding pass from the machine, fill it out at the counter, and go right on board. This is Eastern's way on New York, Washington, New York, Boston short halls of saving time on the ground. No lineup for tickets, buy them on board. No baggage check-in, haul your luggage yourself in a cart to the gate. No reservations, you're guaranteed a seat. The first 95 persons to pull boarding passes take the first plane. If there's even one passenger extra, they promise that a standby plane will take him a few minutes later. Planes leave every hour, weekdays until 10. Limited schedules, weekends. It is designed for the busy fellow who wants to leave his travel plans completely flexible. Good afternoon, sir. May I have your airfare now? That'll be $14, please, sir. Okay. $14 and one is 15 and your receipt, Bye. sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Right. Progress, too, in getting passengers from boarding gate into the airplane. United Airlines and others do it with telescoping walkways, a different approach from Pan Am's umbrella roof. When a plane arrives at the gate position, the walkway is extended right to the entrance door of the airplane. This relieves the passenger of having to buck wind gusts, rain puddles, and mechanics carts. This is fine but it does nothing about the often sizable walk to the boarding gate. The Federal Aviation Agency administrator tells of a plan that would keep a traveler out of puddles as well as spare him that height. It's a plan uh, which is called the mobile lounge. Uh, the concept is that the passenger comes to the air airport terminal on a high-speed, non-commuter cluttered highway, uh, and he then walks perhaps 200 feet from the limousine or his private automobile or taxi, past the ticket counter and into what appears at first to him to be a lounge within the terminal. At the right time, the lounge disengages itself and drives out to the waiting airplane about a mile away. The airplane and the fuel and the noise are thus a mile from the terminal. Now, this mobile lounge, or big bus, is the largest automotive vehicle ever built. It's about 50, 60 feet long, 
30 feet high, 18 feet wide, and carries 90 passengers. Now, uh, this concept is untried. It's an innovation. We may have some troubles on icy runways and the like. But instead of having the passenger walk all the way from the ticket counter out to the airplane, the terminal, you might say, goes out to the airplane. And we believe this eight to 10 minute ride, this concentration of the noisy, dangerous part of the operation one mile from the terminal may be an example that can be followed elsewhere. Aviation is not a quiet activity, never has been. But jet noise is a new, unnerving order of sound. There's talk of transferring some jet operations farther out in the country. Trouble is, this means even longer time spent getting from downtown to the airport. Of New York's three major airports, International, Idlewild, is farthest from Manhattan, 18 miles. Sites for a fourth airport have been surveyed as far out as 87 miles. There are many problems, finding a willing community, traffic, and jet noise. What's the answer? Well, Mr. Hallaby, with the increase in jet travel, and uh, sometime in the future, supersonic jets even, are we going to have to move our airports farther from the cities? We are hoping that as technological change occurs, that we can manage it well enough so that the power plants of the advancing aircraft will have enough power and less noise, that they will have so much power available per weight that they can take off sooner and at a higher angle, even though they may go faster when in flight. Uh, we would therefore hope that the jet international type airports could remain uh, where they are and accommodate more modern aircraft. That will be our goal. Airports always have attracted home builders. Many residents, of course, were there before the airport. Many came in quieter piston days. But others knew jets were coming. Why did they move in? One thing certain, Lots of airport area residents are unhappy today. All night long, two, three o'clock, four, oh, last five, night the same night. way. Well, now Every we have to worry, we have the problem of the school. But now they tell us, because of the airplanes, they're not going to put up a school for us, which isn't fair. We've been fighting with petitions, and they say that does no good. You call up and complain, they say that doesn't do any good. There's nothing we can do about it. We are practically off limits to any prospective house purchaser. The planes flying over our area is a thing that people have gotten to a point to where children wake up in the middle of the night screaming. We did an extensive renovation job last summer and practically every one of our ceilings are cracked. When we first bought the house out here, we didn't think the situation was going to be as bad as it is, but... to a family to have to say 15 years to buy a house of your choice only to discover that you've made a mistake. I hope that mistake can be rectified before it becomes the kind of problem that drives us away. Would you say, Mr. Hallaby, that we're just going to have to learn to live with the noise of the jet age? Well, you know, we've always learned to live with noise. Uh, uh, I guess the first... Uh, pioneering achievement in this was the mother and father learning to live with the baby's cry in the mid middle of the night. Another one was the, the sound of the railroad locomotive, which was quite irritating to the farmers and city dwellers when it came through uh, spouting smoke and fire and setting fire to the farms and, and the fields. The next was the, the automobile, which was a frightening looking machine making a terrible noise when it first appeared. Certainly the construction noise of a pneumatic hammer uh, is, is much higher than that of a distant uh, jet airplane or a helicopter. So I think 
one of the prices of progress and power is going to be uh, a level of noise. If it's dangerous to, to health and life, it should not be tolerated. But if it's just irritable, I'm afraid that's one of the prices of so-called progress. Noise levels of jet flights at Idlewild are measured by Port Authority teams. If an airline habitually flouts rules designed to minimize noise, the authority will take action to stop it. Carl, 621, this is Sound Crew. What was your reading on the last flyover? This is 621. I read 95 over 90. Okay, that checks out with the PMS. The next takeoff will be American 85. Take a position on 31 left. This reporter took an American Airlines flight around Idlewild to see what procedures pilots follow to minimize jet noise and to learn what they think about this. Captain Elston, that rapid climb certainly didn't inconvenience us passengers any. It wasn't at all uncomfortable. What do you, the pilots, feel about it? Would you prefer some other kind of a takeoff? Well, actually, uh, we would prefer a little flatter climb if we had our druthers. However, there's nothing wrong with the climb that we made, and uh, no one certainly objects to it. Captain Hilston, we've heard a great deal about noise suppressors on the engines themselves. Why aren't the aircraft equipped with those? On the original 707, we had uh, quite a, an assembly on the rear of the engine to take care of this particular uh, nuisance, if you want to call it that, and uh, reduce the noise down to a reasonable level. This cost us uh, considerable performance, of course, something like 2 or 3% in our flight performance, and uh, is something that we ultimately uh, got around, you might say, by using newer and uh, more modern engines. In fact, we're using the latest fan uh, engine, which uh, gives us terrific performance in climb so that we can get up and over these communities much uh, quicker and much better and with much less noise than we could with the other engines. So instead of uh, cutting the power with noise suppressors, you've gone in the other direction and increased the power to get up faster. Yes, sir. The power has been increased from something like 14,500 pounds of thrust to about 17,000. But hasn't that increased the noise? Uh, no, sir. Uh, oddly enough, uh, we have uh, no trouble with the Astrojet because of the fact that we are so high over the community by the time we get there. Captain Elston, the complaining neighbors to airports say that the landings are as bad as the takeoffs. What can you do about the landings? Well, there's uh, quite a few things that we can do and have been doing, particularly more recently. Uh, number one, we can maintain our altitude for a longer length of time before starting a descent down into the uh, final approach pattern. Also, uh, we can avoid uh, dirtying up the airplane, so to speak, by lowering flaps and gear. By keeping the airplane clean, we can use a minimum of power and hence uh, create a minimum amount of noise. These are a few of the measures, then, that the industry has taken to make jet operations a little quieter. There are others. Flight patterns around airports are laid out to avoid the most densely populated areas. Night takeoffs in some directions are forbidden. Flaps coming down 20. Flaps 20 indicated. Green lights okay. And emergency flap switches off. There's only so much that can be done. The hope is that enough can be done so that jets are not completely intolerable to people living below their paths. Convenient air travel is essential to the nation's economic health, and in many ways to its security. Getting from downtown to the airport is inconvenient and wasteful enough today. Move the airports another 20 or 30 miles out, and ground time could become the major portion of the trip.
Even if eventually they whisk you to the airport, will you still fight a traffic jam in the terminal? Logic says no. Logic says an industry that can operate 600 mile an hour jets should process passengers at better than canal barge speeds. Some airlines have devised imaginative improvements. The industry as a whole still has plenty of streamlining to do in the frenetic age of the jet. <laughs>